Welcome to Ensuring Success 2016. If you're just joining us, we are so happy to have you here with us. If you've been here uh, for part or all of the day, we are thrilled to have you still sticking it out with us. We're having a great time here in Dallas at AMS Pictures. Um, we are uh, about to launch into our ninth hour of Ensuring Success, our ninth session today. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, give a shout out to our sponsors who are making this event possible for us. And they are the Business Learning Institute, Stacy K Academy, Sage, Sure Payroll, Zero, Avalara, Rivio Clearinghouse, and Intuit ProConnect. So thank you to all of them. Uh, if you are just joining us for the first time during this session, I'd like to tell you real quickly how you will get CPE credit if you so desire. During the session at three times, I will call attention to the fact that a number is appearing on the bottom of the screen and you need to write down that number. So each time a number appears, three different numbers will appear, you need to write those numbers down. At the end of the session or at the end of the day, um, click the CPE tab at the top of your screen and that will open a page that lists all of the sessions that we've done today. Click on any session that you attended and enter the numbers that you wrote down during the session and uh, take the optional survey if you like and then uh, click to submit that information and your C CPE certificate will be made available to you right away. So I am Gail Perry. I am Editor-in-Chief of CPA Practice Advisor Magazine, um, and I am monitoring uh, email here on the, the uh, computer, so if you're trying to reach us, please do. You can ask questions of our speakers, um, or just tell us how you're doing. If you're still hanging out and about to start your ninth hour, as am I, then we want to hear about that, too. In fact, uh, feel free to shoot a picture of yourself and your computer <laughs> screen and post it up on Red Twitter. Eyes. You can reach us on Twitter or find us on Twitter at hashtag DecemberCPE. And uh, you can also reach us on email at info at ensuringsuccess.com. And you can find us on Facebook at the CPA Practice Advisor Facebook page. So feel free to give us a shout out up there and post a picture um, of yourself enjoying this wonderful marathon event. So today uh, I am joined by Jim Burke and David Cieslak. We were here the last hour too, if you happen to be in that session. Uh, this time we're gonna be talking about data security. And I'd like uh, Jim and David to introduce themselves briefly and then we'll get into our topic. I'll let you start this All one. All right, sounds good. So I am Jim Burke. I'm a partner with Witham Smith & Brown in uh, New Jersey. I oversee internal technology. I, I'm a practice leader for our technology niche practice. And uh, I, I literally live in the technology space. So get around the country speak with CPA firms about technology, speak about technology as it impacts the profession today. So uh, again, something I totally, totally obsess over, technology and the profession. Mm -hmm. I'm David Cieslak, I'm a principal and founder with a company called Arxis Technology in Los Angeles. Uh, some people may know me by, by my alter ego, Inspector Gadget, uh, but I am, like, like Jim, I am all about technology in the accounting space, really uh, kind of characterize it as living at the intersection between uh, technology and, uh, and accounting. And, but to me, it's all about leveraging technology to work smarter. Excellent. All right, um, in talking about data security, I think it, it makes sense to start with the cloud, and I always like the concept of the cloud, which is like up there, right? But mm -hmm. actually, where is the cloud? The cloud is actually very much down to earth or you know, <laughs> grounded. Uh, it literally is, it refers to, you know, essentially data centers uh, that could be located locally, you know, somewhere, you know, th throughout the country or even internationally. But uh, essentially, uh, you don't need to worry about it. Someone else is taking care of the hardware, the infrastructure, the operating systems. They're taking care of the, the IT resources on the backside. Uh, but those resources, you know, quite literally are, are could be located located anywhere. So I, t I tell firms and clients, you know, when I say cloud, all I mean is take that data outside of your bricks and mortar, take that technology and put it outside, mm -hmm. right? That's the cloud. It's out there. It's in different places, right? Mm -hmm. They're all different places on the cloud, and we'll talk a little bit about that as, as the hour goes by. But it's just taking it outside of your space. So it That's could be it. in the parking lot. It could, it, you know what? <laughs> it could be in the parking lot. It could be under the parking lot. It could be mm. above the parking lot. Mm. It's outside of your mm. bricks and mortar, mm. right? Just get it out. That's the cloud. Okay. So could it all go away? 
What's that, the cloud? Uh -huh. So, you know, this is interesting because, you know, we're, we're like Jim, you know, we're, we're talking to almost all of our clients right now about transitioning at least some, if not all, of what they do internally, internal system-based mm -hmm. solutions, uh, and transitioning that to cloud-based uh, solutions. And so, I, you know, the, the, the classic question always comes up, you know, what happens if the cloud goes down? Well, the cloud, you know, doesn't go down. In fact, what you find is that there's actually better uptime, better fault tolerance. Uh, you know, they've done a better job of, of, you know, doing disaster preparedness than most, you know, individual practitioners or, or, or uh, organizations are able to do on their own. So what you actually have is better uptime, better service, better security. And I know we'll talk about that uh, in those cloud-based options. So when we talk about the cloud going down, it's usually your, con mm -hmm. your connection mm -hmm. To the cloud so that it's still right. Down. It's your problem, right? When the cloud, yeah. so the cloud, you're does, the weak link, right? The yeah. cloud doesn't go down. It's yeah. it's how we access. So you know, you raised a good point. We're, you know, we're we're trying to push our clients. We're trying to push firms to the cloud. You know, don't hide from it. Go to the cloud. I often tell people, if I were to start my own CPA firm today, I would be 100% in the cloud. Absolutely, absolutely, every single application I use would be in the cloud. Nothing left behind. Nothing in my bricks and mortar. I want me and all of my staff to be able to collaborate with all of our clients anywhere, anytime, right? That's, that's the key part about this. It, it, the fact that we have a more robust infrastructure in the cloud than we could ever build internally that's huge. Well, and just by, the, by virtue of the fact that it is located outside of our four walls, it's enabling in and of itself. It, en it enables us to do things that, you know, we would have to kind of create that infrastructure internally in order to replicate some of that functionality. So straight away, just by moving to the cloud, you're going to be able to do things you can't do reasonably it, uh, locally. It reasonably and for a reasonable cost, right? Uh, the the you know, we hear about breaches, we'll talk about this. We, we hear about breaches every single day and it scares people to move to the cloud when they hear about some big high profile breaches. If the high profile breaches take place, what about the small breaches? That's why, Jim, I'm concerned to go to the cloud. You know, I, I would argue your data is safer in the cloud than it is behind Much. your bricks and mortar. Much. Think about it. Think about having a server in your office, mm -hmm. okay, which we all had at one point in time or another. What could happen? Fire damage, rain, oh, but I got backups. When was the last time you checked your backups? Mm -hmm. Did you ever restore mm -hmm. those backups? And think about all the maintenance that needs to take place on those yep. servers internally. Go to the cloud, yeah. push it out there. So uh, these questions may seem simplistic, but mm -hmm. who takes care of the cloud since it's an, a physical, it is multiple physical An places. imaginary person, Gail, <laughs> takes care of the cloud. It's yeah. right. The it, cloud gnomes. Right. <laughs> it's, it depends on what flavor of the cloud you have. Yeah. Let's, suppose, you, let's suppose you're up on my, um, uh, Microsoft's Azure or Amazon Web Services. Just those two as an example. Well, you can, I will tell you, there are teams of people that are taking care of maintaining the, that cloud environment. Think about it. Resources that you never had available to you in your firm before. Now you're relying, and you're paying for it. You're paying for that maintenance. You're paying for the redundancy. You're paying for that uptime. That's, that's key. So depending on what flavor, maybe you're using a vendor cloud. Lots of vendors in our space offer a cloud model. Part of that is you're paying the vendor fees to maintain those data centers and that cloud environment. But if you think about what you have, you have redundancy, uh, you have backups, you have failover, you have military grade, in, you know, uh, essentially security available to you. So it's physical, it's, it's you know, they're, they're doing constant monitoring. Uh, they're making certain no one has physical access to your, you know, your servers, your resources. So you are going to get a, a solution that by definition is more secure than anything you're going to be able to replicate internally. Uh, and, I, and I mean that almost universally. And I don't care how large or small the organization mm -hmm. is. It's a more secure solution, so tell not me, a less secure. Are, are you, I mean, when I hear people afraid of the cloud, I understand why, because of all the high profile breaches that are out there. I'd be more afraid of that manual file room, those red wells, those, those manila folders <laughs> in those file rooms subject to fire damage, wind, yeah. rain, destruction, hurricanes, whatever. Earthquakes. S earthquakes, yeah. just, a, just a file that gets yeah. misplaced, yep. right? Think about that. So much of that could happen today. So in the cloud, it's organized, it's there, it's readily available, but you're right. You need to make sure that you set your business up. If I'm going to the cloud, I don't just have a 
I don't have a fire hose to the cloud. I got I, I have a massive pipe to the cloud, so, and I have dual redundancies. Yeah, I, and I have multiple ways to get to the cloud. If multiple my primary companies. way goes down, I have redundancy in place. And then you, you know, and if if all that all else fails, you know, you lose connectivity at the office. Uh, you know, I go home. Probably a coffee shop yeah. on the corner right. that you know has free Wi-Fi, and you can continue your work from there. Go someplace, access that data. Just keep in mind, anywhere, anytime. Mm -hmm. That's what I mm -hmm. want to have the ability to do. When I take it outside of my office and I put it in the cloud, I want access 24/7, anywhere, anytime. Okay, we're going to uh, drop the first CPE number on the screen, so pay attention to the bottom of your screen and write down this number if you would like to obtain CPE credit for today's, uh, for this particular session, and there will be two more numbers coming to you later in the broadcast. So, um, what is encryption, and how does that relate to data that's stored in the cloud, and what do people need to know about it? Do you want to take that? Mm, okay, so, it doesn't it, matter. so encryption is really just the process of, of making the, the data unreadable without some kind of unlocking or decryption key. So, and there's all sorts of ciphers that have been used over time. Uh, some of them simple. Today, you know, we talk about AES, you know, uh, 128 or 256 bit, you know, encryption as being kind of the baseline of what you'd probably want. But essentially what it says is, absent, you know, the unlocking key, then this is just gibberish. And you're not going to be able to just, you know, it's not clear data. It's not in the clear. So you're not just going to be able to look at it and go, oh, isn't this great? I have a whole, you know, wealth of credit card numbers and driver's license, social security and birthdays and mother's maiden names. I mean, you know, that's a, yeah, that, that is just, you know, a disaster. So, you know, we, we always say uh, that you want to make sure that the data uh, is both encrypted at rest, meaning, you know, where it's being stored, as well as in transit. So when we think about the cloud, we're going to open up some kind of secure connection to this host server, and we're either doing it through a browser, in which case we want to see on the URL line and at the top of our browser, our HTTPS, which means secure. And that's that means the little that, lock. Yeah, and the little mm -hmm. lock, and that means it's now this session, this connection right now is being encrypted. So as you're you know putting in information, that's you know being encrypted, you know on your end, being decrypted at the other end. Uh, so you've got a secure kind of you know pipe between you in that host uh, or a VPN if it's internal you know servers so again uh, uh, encrypted uh, when it's at rest encrypted in transit uh, are, are very important things because you don't want somebody just breaking in or being man in the middle or listening in on that conversation as it were or being able to once they've got physical access to be able to just see the data in the clear so years ago it wasn't as important as it is today with the cloud being out there. We all had that data working within our offices. We felt uh, as long as that data was protected within the offices, anyone connected to that network, it was all good. But with the advent of the internet and connectivity to the outside world brought more uh, issues with data at rest. As David mentioned, even now data that resides internally should be secured, should be encrypted at rest. As long as there's a pipeline and opening out to the cloud where you allow others in, other individuals in to touch things. And very often you don't think about this. Maybe I have a website. Where's that web server? Am I maintaining it? Are other people connected to that web server that may be connected to something else? So you always need to keep that in mind as you start to connect systems and data to the internet and to the cloud. All of our practices today are connected to the cloud in some way, shape, or form. And all of us at the same time are also connected to local servers internally. So there lies the risk of that data. Data must always be encrypted. He mentioned that risk while in transit. To, there's no other way to do it today. No other way to have access. Um, okay, so I think everybody who's listening and probably everybody who uses a computer has mm -hmm. gotten messages saying you have to change your password. Mm -hmm. So why do I have to keep changing my password? Why can't I just have a password? No way. <laughs> no way. It's, you, know, you, you look at best practices. You know, what's the most common password? One, two, three, four, five, six? Password. Uh, it's so easy today for hackers to uh, obtain that information. And why a complex password? Why not your mother's maiden name, right? Which is suggested years ago. Well, you got to stay away from words, dictionary words, names, things like that. You could easily, I, you could easily run an application, a free application off the web to go in and decipher passwords. It's so easy to do. So use longer passwords, use more complex passwords, make things unique, numbers, letters, special characters, spaces, uppercase, lowercase, 
blend it up and make it long. That's why I tell everyone, just make it long and mix it up. Yeah, so passwords are just one piece of the puzzle, and candidly, uh, we are we have quickly moved to a place where we all should be, uh, whenever possible, uh, taking advantage of what's called multi-factor authentication. So the password is what's known as a shared secret. It's something you know, and absolutely, you want to make certain that the password itself has a certain level of complexity to it, such that you can't fall prey to a, what's called a dictionary attack, which is you know within a matter of just seconds, you know, seconds. Yeah, is is easy to to. to to basically hack into that, you know, and, and, and especially if you're using really poor passwords like <laughs> password one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, but that being said, you know, most all vendors now uh, are moving toward, especially in a cloud-based world, saying it's not enough to have a password, just one factor, it's something you know. It also has to be something you have or something you are. So something you have, uh, so think of it, you know, they're, they're saying, well, uh, at the same time you're putting in your name and your password, I'm gonna send you a code to your phone your phone is what you have, so something I know, my login name and password, something I have, my mm -hmm. phone, that becomes a second factor, that's actually called two-step authentication, not, not even just two-factor, two-step, because it's the second step. But so two-factor authentication, and many products now, think of when you're unlocking your laptop, I may be able mm -hmm. to swipe my finger, I may be able to Biometric look, devices. You know, look in a camera, that's something I am, so something I know, something I have, something I am. So multi-factor authentication dramatically improves just you know the, the guarding uh, or the access to those, those assets. Right, you want to keep those key, keys to the kingdom secret. You want to keep them locked up. You want to make it very difficult. Uh, different individuals use a CPA firm, example. Uh, in larger firms, you have executive committees, you got management committees, you got boards of directors. Well, maybe those individuals have certain <coughs> rights to data that are different than your power professionals, your staff ones, your entry level people, you want to make sure you protect that data to the extent to which you use multi-factor authentication, things like that, to the point where I can walk up to my computer and my camera recognizes it's me and allows me in. That's huge versus remembering a password and sharing, worst case, sharing that password with someone else to access my data. And usually it's the most privileged users who complain the most about passwords, don't want to change them, put them on post-it notes around their screen. I mean, they are oftentimes our, our, our most challenging offenders, I'll call them, uh, because they're the ones who just really are more concerned about convenience and really not attuned enough to the security aspects of things. So I always tell people, think about security first, convenience mm -hmm. second, and if we're doing our jobs correctly, we're doing our jobs well, then we should be able to create secure environments, highly secure environments that aren't too terribly inconvenient. So, well. so ne next time, if you have a larger firm, someone in your IT department comes up to you and says, you know what, we really need to mandate password uh, changes. We want to do it every 60 days. We want to do it every 90 days. Don't shoot them, okay? Embrace it. Say, no problem, I'll remember another password. That's the least you can do is remember that password and continually change it. Yeah, so one of the things we've started doing is, uh, you know, especially with cloud-based services, we've started moving toward what's called a single sign-on tool. And a single sign-on tool, an SSO tool, allows you to uh, essentially aggregate, you know, all of those login names and passwords, your credentials. It gives you a dashboard for your credentials, and you can say, my credentials for this application are this, for this application it's that. And so the good news is, is as we start to provision more and more cloud-based applications across the organization, it's very very easy for me to provision a new user, deprovision a user. Somebody says, you know, today is my last day. It's boom, and they're they're off because I basically just pull them back from the single sign-on tool, and they instantly then are disconnected from or no longer have access to all the other applications that that you know that that control panel, as it were. So, in single sign-on tools can integrate with Active Directory. So, if you still have an in-house uh, Active Directory configuration with Microsoft, and you're saying I want to provision the user there, but I also want to you know have that link to the single sign-on tool, uh, and it also allows you to actually mask the login name and password, uh, you know, behind that tool. So, in other words, I only know my login name and password to get me to that control panel, but the login name and password that when I click on this icon, it's going to then pass to that web uh, service. I have no idea what it is, and it could be very complex, mm -hmm. very difficult to hack, uh, and so I don't have to worry about when I, if I deprovision a user, that they're just going to go home because they, they know the login name and password that gets them right into the program, mm -hmm. so they just work right, so no. I mean, I'm able to hide the login names and passwords from the end users yeah, to, using that single sign-on tool. To that point, it is so easy today. So to me, those single sign-on tools make it so easy. Oh. So yeah. I go in, 
one of the first things I did when, I, when we started deploying a single sign-on tool, I went into all those other websites that I historically had gone into. I changed the passwords right out of the gate, made it super complex. I don't mm -hmm. even have a clue what those passwords yep, right. are today. And you know what? I don't need to know what those passwords right. are, but I do need to know my one password to get yep. into the tool. That's what's really critical to me. Once I'm in, once I have it, the rest is passed through. Well, and then the other thing, mm -hmm. too, is then IT can start to play a more proactive role in making certain that at passwords get updated every 60 days. You're not torturing the end user with that. You're making that password change inside the single sign-on tool. The end user doesn't have to worry about and it. And we don't need to know They've what just that password changed, is. You've changed the credential in the single sign-on tool. They're just happily logging in doing, and that's what it looks like when they log in, by the way. You know, so that, you know, they're just happily logging in. Uh, they have no idea that the password's changed. They have no idea. It's, it's incredibly complex. So IT can help maintain, you know, good password policy and that single sign-on tool really can bring some good management to the overall password process. And it still uh, can enable you to, or still allows for that multi-factor of authentication and many, too. And many of those single sign-on tools are available out there in the marketplace, very reasonably priced. Mm -hmm. And just by selecting a tool like that, you simplify the process and you're, you're actually enforcing. Dramatically you know, improve security. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we've got uh, several questions here. One, um, this is a solo practitioner who uses professional tech software from Intuit and they do not provide cloud access. Please recommend a few sources or places to move my tech software to. I don't know if we'll want to yeah, start so, recommending. Yeah, uh, so, you know, at some point, mm -hmm. you know, we understand that there are going to be some CPA firm products, that are just not tools in the cloud. that just yeah. aren't cloud-based yet, or there's not mm -hmm. a cloud version. And that's not to say you couldn't transition it to a, a hosted cloud. server, a private cloud, right. uh, you know, something like an Amazon or a Google mm -hmm. or a Microsoft. They do, in fact, provide what we'll call either bare metal or they do provide a platform that you could move it to the cloud and gain some of the, the benefits that a, the cloud cloud offers, it won't be a tr what we'll call a true cloud SaaS multi-tenant solution, but at least it's no longer inside your four walls. Exactly, get it outside your bricks and mortar, right? So again, we all deal with those vendors every single day. Many of the leg legacy vendors in our marketplace have pretty much in-house solutions. Most, many are migrating out, so as your vendors do migrate to the cloud, I would suggest, suggest embrace that process. If you're dealing with some vendors that just, it's a long-term strategy to get to the cloud, they're telling you it's gonna be 10 years or so before we get to the cloud, I'd give some serious consideration about changing vendors and go with those that embrace that cloud model. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, jumping back to the earlier discussion about mm -hmm. um, where the cloud is and phys physically the servers that mm -hmm. house the data, um, any, can you give any guidance as to where these centers actually mm -hmm. are located? Well, some of the vendors don't want to tell you where they are mm -hmm. for the very reason that there's, that's called physical security. security. They, don't, they don't publicize that. Uh, and so the, many of them are in very nondescript warehouse looking type buildings. Mm -hmm. If you're in the IT business, you may you know, have reason to visit you know, one uh, or several over time. But generally speaking, no, it's not on their business cards and they're not putting it out there <laughs> on their website. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you geographically where is it, it is. Is it in the, the state of you know, wherever, Texas, California, New York? You know, because there are some folks who basically say, we can't offshore the data. We're not allowed to offshore mm -hmm. the you know, uh, legislation and you know, rules don't allow us, uh, you know, laws don't allow us to offshore anything, so I need to know that it's a domestic-based, you know, host or, or that, that it's domestic-based And you will, get that, you will get that from the vendors. If you yeah. specifically request that, those vendors that understand our space, the space where we practice, let's say you're preparing tax <laughs> returns, you don't want that tax data residing outside of uh, our borders, mm -hmm. that you want it to reside within the United States, uh, get that in writing from your vendors that are out there in the cloud. Yeah. That data will reside within the United States. We're not going to tell you exactly where in the United States the data is. We'll give you general ideas. It's in the east, it's in the west, it's in central. Uh, I personally, I've visited data centers. You want, you want to get a handle on data centers, you want to see the security, they're, they're going to blow you away. Mm -hmm. you, go to, you go to a data center, to get into a data center, the iris scanning, the 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 the, the, the handprints, the man it, traps, uh, it is it, it's it, it's huge to get it's, into. It's a technology Disneyland. It really it, it, is. But it's something, and I, I enjoy going to visit data centers. Yeah. But it's it's a technology that we can never deploy to secure data oh. within all of our firms. Yeah. And that's why I say, if I'm starting my own firm today, I'm out in the cloud mm -hmm. because I've seen the security in place and redundancy in place around these data centers today. Something we can never recreate within our firm environment. Okay, if uh, an accounting firm transitions to cloud-based accounting software and tax software, does that require that their clients are now using cloud-based software too? Love it. Uh, it. When I 
it, when I move to, to a collaborative tool, like, uh, like one of our sponsors, Zero. So if, if, if my clients are using Zero uh, to do their accounting, I'm, I'm now on Zero as well. So I would encourage that. It's, you want to make more money in your practice. You want to take your practice to the next level. You want to collaborate in an easier way with your clients on year-end tax planning. It's perfect this month in December. We're collaborating using those tools that Zero has in place. Uh, I mean, it just makes it easier when my clients are on the same platforms as we are. Yeah, well, but secure file transfers, client portals, I mean, keep coming back to security first, convenience second. Uh, we need to really be very mindful now more than ever, especially in light of so many of these just high profile hacks. And, and candidly, most of the hacks that are taking place are, I'll call them low tech. You know, they're, they're basically somebody is using a dumb password. Somebody has clicked on something they shouldn't have clicked on and now their workstation is compromised and a keystroke logger is there capturing stuff or somebody has been sucker punched by a phishing scam and entered their credentials, uh, you know, because they were prompted to reconfirm their connection to some, you know, uh, outside tool. And so it's those sucker punches. It's those, it's those things that we're doing probably without really thinking it, you know, through that, you know, really represent the opportunity for the black hats to compromise our systems. You'll notice we almost never say that, you know, the this web host, this cloud host has been compromised. Right. That is incredibly rare. What normally happens is we as end users do something not so smart and our workstation or, you know, something locally gets compromised and it keeps coming back to we can't reproduce the, the same level of, you know, military grade security that we're enjoying and we have access to with these, these hosted services internally. The the best thing that we could do for our clients and the best thing that we could do for our own staff is education. Mm -hmm. Every single thing, Dave, that you just mentioned deals with an employee issue. Uh, an employee going, utilizing Wi-Fi, open Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi, hotel Wi-Fi that may not be secure to access private and confidential information, yep. phishing scams, yep. things like that. It has to do with education. I think the more we can invest as we move to the cloud in that employee, uh, knowledge and education piece, that's huge. Yep. That's, that's, that's where we're vulner vulnerable. Yeah. My managing partner always says to me, Jim, are we good? Are we good? Are you sure we're good? We're moved to the cloud, are we good? And we're only as good as our employees. The more we educate them about what's right and wrong for technology, yep. the safer we will all be as we move to the cloud. Agreed. Okay, so what's the accountant's role in consulting with clients regarding data security? You know, I, I I went out and I got security certified through an organization called SANS, and I don't well, know you're that you're not I, the average accountant, <laughs> though, right? I, and which is what I was about to say. I don't necessarily recommend it for everyone, and it's not required, uh, you know, for certain. But I, I really did it because I wanted to, to dig deep and understand, and really, I wanted to have a sense of what's the right size, you know, what's the right approach to IT security from a from a small and medium practice perspective, uh, and so it was incredibly insightful, you know, incredibly educational. Uh, the process I went through, the, the, the exams and the boot camp and the, and the paper that I had to write and so forth. But all of that to say that I think that there's, uh, you know, as a profession, there's some good tools. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, Jim can speak to, to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, some of where, where the, the, the latest tools and, and uh, you know, guidance is in, in that regard. Uh, but I would tell you there's some, you know, there, there are some, some good security organizations out there. But really, it's, it's a matter of evaluating the components of your IT infrastructure and understanding you know what are the, the 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 security risks in connection with each of the the aspects of your infrastructure and what's the right size security response to that uh, and then make certain that both internally as well as then as we're communicating with our clients uh, you know what's the the appropriate level of security do you want to go out and become your own security consultant uh, you know there are again there are you know certification programs in and around that and even you know the AICPA is is really starting to land more much harder uh, in that space and saying we want to be a resource, we want to be, uh, you know, viewed in the industry as, as folks who are highly aware, highly skilled, and, and very capable of, of helping uh, deliver secure solutions. You think about it, CPAs, we are perfectly positioned to help our clients as they navigate those waters when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, we, we talked earlier about in, in the past session and actually earlier sessions today, you heard about advisory services, you heard about you know, the audit, the tax work, it's turning into a commodity. What else could we be doing as CPAs? Man, cybersecurity. There's not one client that I have 
that does not need help in understanding cybersecurity and awareness and education. We're perfectly positioned to be able to do that. Yep. You know, to your point, yes, the AICPA has been feeding us a tremendous amount of tools and information about the whole cybersecurity space and the whole technology space for many, many years. It goes back to trust service principles, goes back to uh, just really embedding us in that technology space. Yep. And so I know they have the the the, the SOC reports. Yeah. So so yeah. To that point, right? Service organizational control, not SOCs, but S O C. Mm -hmm. SOC one, SOC two, SOC three are the three reports. I will tell you today, you know, when uh, the AICPA is starting to own that space, mm -hmm. I'm so happy that as a profession. You know, we're the trusted professionals, and now we're starting to own that SOC space. SOC so, 1, SOC 2, SOC 3. So, and that gives us independent verification that that provider, so when we talk about mm -hmm. security around a cloud host, do you just take it on faith because they have a big name, that, you know, they're one of the big providers? No, there is actually, you know, third-party verification that's being performed against you know, really any any service that, that wants to be a true cloud-based, you know, offering, uh, you know, in, in parallel with them saying, you know, here's the application to, that we're bringing to market, here's what it does, here's all the great things it'll do for your organization. Uh, we also want you to know that we've been independently certified or verified uh, that we're operating and in, in offering this up in a secure environment. So again, that it's an attestation engagement, you know, a SOC 2 or SOC 3, Audit can be done around that service, and that gives us that independent verification, that independent certification or sense that that, that in fact that's being offered up in a secure so, manner. So, to David's point, let's think about what's going on right now. This is perfect timing for today's streaming CPE event. Is December fifth? There's an exposure draft out uh, by the AICPA. Uh, it's out for exposure through December fifth, and what it basically does, it says, you know what, CPAs, you should be in this cybersecurity space, and you know what, we have this offering, this SOC two, that really is aligned with that space. Mm -hmm. So go check out uh, the exposure drafts that are out there. You have uh, you know four more days to take a look at those exposure drafts. Uh, give Great your idea. comments, understand about that, but it's really opening it up, saying, you know what, as, as a profession, we really should own this space. We have the procedures, we have the tools uh, to go in to understand the client security, uh, understand their readiness uh, with respect to this space. And more importantly, it's now giving us guidance on things that we need to follow to give assurances in certain areas, mm -hmm. okay? Because it was historically the Wild West out there. Every other person was providing cybersecurity services, but what does that do at the end of the day? What if, does that mean I'm not going to be hacked? It doesn't mean you're not going to be hacked. It means we followed certain procedures mm. that we were supposed to follow to give assurance on that space. And that's what the AICPA, and I believe they're going to be successful in totally owning that space. And home run for all those CPAs across the country that uh, it's really going to create opportunities from a revenue generation yeah, uh, for the practice. If you're practices. a company today that accepts credit cards in any form or fashion, you probably are already aware of and, and subject to the PCI DSS rules, so payment card industry data security standards. And I would tell you today that is, I don't want to call it the gold standard, but it's a pretty high bar mm -hmm. in terms of security and, and, and so forth. So within the payment card industry, they had to do something to, to, to you know, kind of get the Wild West a little under, more under control. So I would tell you that, you know, it, it uh, you know, SOC 2 or SOC 3, you know, a SOC engagement won't necessarily get you around the PCI DSS compliance requirements. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, as you look at those standards, you look at what the, the SOC standards are, and all of a sudden you're saying, we have an opportunity to really do all that we reasonably should be doing to create a secure environment with these standards. Yep, I agree. And with third parties, with uh, now part of peer review, taking a look over our shoulders, making sure we are dotting our I's, crossing our T's, making sure we are following those standards that are put out there by our profession, I think it's really going to help to elevate this CPA's exposure in that space. Okay, we're going to put the second CPE code on the screen right now, so be sure to write down this code if you're planning on requesting CPE for this session. Uh, we have some more questions, too. Um, this uh, attendee says uh, he or she encrypts tax returns using Adobe Acrobat mm -hmm. with passwords and then emails them. Is that sufficient protection? It, it, it's better than doing nothing. Okay, that's what I would say, <laughs> right? It's better yes. than doing nothing. If I'm on the stand someday <laughs> and they say, Jim, 
you sent this unencrypted PDF file to, to a client, but it went to the wrong client, and now that personal confidential information got into the wrong hands, I, um, I have a real duck. problem. But did I at least do something? Did I do something to help protect it? I password protected it. Is it the best thing? Absolutely not. And there's, David? Pa there's <laughs> password cracking tools out there that uh, in a are, heartbeat, you yeah, can crack that, that. That literally, that's what they're designed to do: is essentially unwind or undo or break right through, you know, uh, that kind of password protection. So I said earlier that I think Client Portal is the only way, candidly, we should be exchanging confidential information. Period. Because, uh, you know, while I may send, you know, documents, you know, and, and make some kind of attempt, you know, to to make it protected, you know, we've had clients basically, well, it's too hard, and I don't want to. Mm -hmm. You know, remember, you know, my special unlocking key to, you know, to open the document kind of thing. The, the portals can be friendly. They can be, you know, uh, you know, reasonably easy to use by, you know, even your your most your more challenging clients. Uh, and so we, we look at that and say that's a, that's a baseline uh, that every organization should have in place. So no, it's security. Uh, email by design is not secure. Mm -hmm. And the only way to make it secure is to use digital certificates, which virtually no one is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would just say, look, just know that if you're doing, you know, you're sending information uh, via email, consider it as almost all but in the clear. And, and that's the right mindset to have toward it. I'm not saying it's all in the clear, but I'm saying that's the right mindset. And then from there, even if you're password protecting, know that there's very just commonplace tools that can tear that right off. And to that portal piece, the, the complaint I hear out there from the profession, you know, why aren't we embracing the portal? Our clients are forgetting their passwords. They're constantly asking me for the passwords. Why? Because they're only hitting you up once a year, right? They only come to the portal to get their tax returns, to get their financial statements. Well, you know, we could fix that. Bring our clients to the portal more frequently. You know, maybe not as frequently as they hit up eBay or Amazon or things like that or their bank accounts or their credit cards, but bring them more frequently and they're not going to forget their passwords yeah. because it is a problem. You know, to me, that should be, the portal should be, first and foremost, you know, we're all going into this upcoming tax season. That should be our default way that we deliver our digital tax returns to our clients, it makes right? A statement to the customer too. I mean, you know, yeah. they're basically saying, "Look, I appreciate it that you know, hey, Jim's Jim is saving firms, trees. Yes, you know, <laughs> or, or, or more importantly, they're they're they're, you know, I trust my CPA. That's what you know. That is the the hallmark of, mm -hmm. of our profession, and I want to make certain that I'm creating an environment where I'm not doing I'm 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 reckless I'm reckless with that trust. Right. We we have that fiduciary responsibility to do that. When we deliver something that that contains private and confidential information to our clients to third parties. Parties, we have to do it in a secure fashion. I understand, and we all face this when, when we collect all our client data from our clients working on their tax returns, what inevitably happens? They forget to give us a W-2, they forget to give us a K-1, they forget to give us a 1099. How do they get it to us? They email it, they fax it. Yeah. Do they ever, do your clients ever password protect it or secure it? No, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But we have that fiduciary responsibility to make sure mm -hmm. when we give it back that we do that. Portal, portal, portal. Right, <laughs> portal, portal, portal. In that order. Um, going back to the single sign-on tool, um, we've had a couple people ask if you can give examples of uh, what that oh, would if be. you just do a, a, a web search for single sign-on, you'll get a, a pretty long list. There's mm -hmm. literally dozens of them out there. Okay. We use one. Um, it's called Bidium, mm -hmm. uh, and it's 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 great for for small and medium business is what we've learned. Um, but uh, it, you know, again, they all function reasonably the same way with yep. that that kind of control panel ability to to uh, you know essentially configure uh, passwords and control access through that. Right, uh, but be smart about it. Okay, yeah. don't just go out and download an app that that is able to encrypt and and protect those passwords. Where is that app? Where is that? Who owns the app? Where is that data residing? Ask lots of questions. Yeah, you still have the same due diligence. You to still do. do. The hey, provider. I just downloaded an app off the app store, and I'm now pass, pass, I got all my passwords on there. Well, who has the app? Where is the app? Mm -hmm. Where is it created? Where is the data being stored? Yeah. Uh, ask those questions. Is it encrypted? Is it encrypted? Yep. Who rates? Who rates the app? Who prays yep. it? Find out more information yep. about it before selecting it. But there are a tremendous amount of these applications out there in the space today. Yeah. And if it's free, it's underpriced. Okay, seriously, you really You'll need. You probably get what you, you pay get for. what you pay for with respect yeah. to that. Don't go out there looking for all these free tools to deploy within your enterprise, within your practices. You got too much at risk. 
Um, because one of the sessions we had today uh, was about new services that accountants are offering that their father's accounting firm didn't offer, uh, you mentioned SOC Assurance, SOC Audits. I wondered if you could go into that a little mm -hmm. bit more in terms of if accountants want to get into that arena, what kind of training do they need? Yeah, Where sure. do they get it? What, what is that? Sure. Entail? So, so, so they should be. Look, it's with migration of data to the cloud. If you're scratching your head, how can I differentiate my practice from every other practice down the street, around the block, in, uh, in the same state? Do things that no one else is doing. Take a look at getting into and forming a SOC practice. All the different flavors, there's SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC 3, Type 1, Type 2. I'm not going to explain what all those differences are, but there are, they are, they are differences. Some relate to financial statement assurances, some relate to uh, the trust service principles that are out there, but educate yourself. There, the AICPA runs a great SOC school. Go to the SOC school, attend the SOC school. We've sent some of our staff to the SOC school to bring them up to speed on the standards that are out there, what the reports look like out there, what peer review expects to be included in, that, in those reports that are out there. Uh, and you can really talk to talk about data. Then you start to understand, you know, why doesn't this company have a SOC report? It maintains private and confidential, confidential data. So we create a lot of cross-selling opportunities within our own firm for those SOC engagements just by our exposure and knowledge to that whole SOC area. But yes, it is a, a whole wide open area under the advisory services practice in your practice that will differentiate you and create revenue in other areas. Well, they give you a free pair of socks if you pass the socks. Okay, no, that's S O X. Okay, oh, God, it's not S O C. Just, just checking. But uh, <laughs> but but again, you want to differentiate yourself in the space. It, SOC is not going away. It's going to be good. And now with the linking of, of the cyber and the CPAs with SOC 2, huge opportunity. Jump in right now. A lot of new guidance is coming out about this whole process. And right now, are, are, um, are these service-oriented companies required to have SOC reports, SOC audits, or is it? Well, here's the deal. When it comes to best practices, AICPA, we, as CPAs, we own that space. If I'm a data center, do I have to have a SOC report? No. You know what? You're probably not getting certain customers, certain business because you don't have a SOC report. I met with a, uh, a, a, a prospective client a, a few months ago, and they said, you know what? This customer will not deal with us, Jim, unless we have a SOC report. I'm like, there you go. I've been telling you all along. You should get a SOC report. So not only does it speak to the security and, and you know, all, the, all the things going on with, internally, but it helps to give a level of assurance to a prospect that, you know what, maybe if I put my data on your servers, under your control, you're doing something above and beyond to protect it. So that's it, it helps on the revenue generation side for our customers when you start to talk about it that way. And more and more companies are requiring, you know, that that, that independent certification is in fact in place okay. and asking to see copies of that report. I will tell you, most all of our clients, especially when it comes to, you know, the really sensitive information, the, the financials for the company and so forth. No, I'm not just going to put that out on the cloud with any provider. I want to make certain they've got a third party uh, opinion as well that they're in fact operating ask, in a secure ask the, space. Ask the question. If you're leery about putting your client data from your own firm out to the cloud in that space, ask the question, do you have a SOC report? Is a SOC, if the answer is no, I'd really think twice about dealing with that vendor, especially if I'm putting private and confidential information up there. I want to see a SOC report. Okay. Or the knowledge that a SOC report was done. Um, and what do you think about encrypting emails using Outlook integrated packages or web-based email like mm. Proton? You know what, I, you know, for years I've played with, you know, digital certificates and, you know, encrypted email and what we found, you know. It's uh, not easy. Well, for, yeah, and not only is it not easy, it's only one side of the conversation. To have a, for Jim and I to have a secure conversation, both of us have to have encryption keys, you know, so I encrypt, he can decrypt, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So both of us have to have, you know, a corresponding set of, you know, shared keys uh, to have a completely uh, confidential or, or encrypted conversation. That's one. Two, what we found is that we would put our key, you know, on the message, you know, or the, the public key that you, you intend to transmit. Uh, and that public key, by the way, is the key that they would use in turn to uh, basically encrypt something to send back to you. That's the key that you're putting on the message, the outbound message. But what that was causing was my email message was winding up in a spam filter. Mm -hmm. 
because it would look at the attachment. I don't understand what the attachment is. So I'm going, okay, this isn't really working real well. So if I'm trying to be secure and you know trying to use you know some kind of encryption, and that's why we keep coming back to email. By definition, is not secure, and I don't know that it's reasonable to you know project, suspect, or or plan for that to be a secure medium ever. So you're looking to go to let's say you're looking to go to a portal. When you're selecting a portal, let's say for this upcoming tax season, you still have time. You have you have a couple of months before you're you're full steam into into tax season. Just make sure the portal is easy for you to use. If the portal is going to be easy for you to use, it's probably going to be easy for your client to use. The easier it is to use, the more it's going to be embraced. That's the bottom line. I, I like that model the best. Stay away from email. Use email for having dialogue with clients about non-confidential information. So in some respects, you know, we think about snail mail and you know, you think about going to the to the street and opening the, you know, what do you see in there mostly these days? It's junk. And I would tell you that I think email is largely going that same way. When we think about confidential, you know, highly sensitive information, we got to have a better, you know, means to, to, to move that information back and forth. Email's not great. And so we're seeing, you know, when it comes to signing documents, there's, you know, these, you know, all sorts of document, you know, secure document tools now uh, for e-signatures and, and, you know, the courts, you know, recognize and acknowledge that as, as being valid. Uh, we've got the portals that we've been talking about. So there's, there's tools that are going to give us, you know, that are going to help us with those high value, those, those, those more sensitive transactions, and sadly, you know, they say that you know 90% of all email is spam, and then you know in the next breath they say the good news is it'll, it'll never be 100%. Uh, it sure, it sure seems like it's approaching that because it really it, it has largely gone the way of snail mail. Okay, and we have an attendee who wants a little more information about the portal experience. How do you mm -hmm. how do you use a portal if you're not familiar with that? Yeah, concept? so how do you use a portal? So you want a portal if you have a website. Let's suppose you have a website. You want a portal that is easy for your clients to get to. I, we put a button on our website. Our, our web developers could do it. Links it into our portal product. And all it is is a secure place where our clients can collaborate with us with data. But it's a hosted server, so it's important mm -hmm. to, to point out that, mm -hmm. you know, really, these aren't things that you're setting up internally and maintaining right. on local servers. We're not suggesting that. So right. there's, there's third-party tools, third-party customer portal tools out there that you subscribe to. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's one more subscription, as it were, mm -hmm. but it, you subscribe to it. They maintain it. They update it. They make certain that it's always secure. They, that's the service they provide as a secure customer right. portal. They so can subscribe. make it look and feel yep. just like so you. you. Right? Mm -hmm. So you could be just like the big firms, okay? If you're a smaller firm, they hit your website, they come to your website, they click a client uh, portal button. What they don't understand is even though that next screen is all branded up with your logo and everything, that's not your server. That's not you. Client has no clue about that. They simply click through and they have access to the portal. That's the key part about it. You are not creating a portal. You're not creating that window. You're using third-party applications out there that are integrated into your website to be able to do that. The key, it's all secure. That's that's what's so important here. The data sits there secure. Okay. And uh, we've had several people ask for recommendations about portals, and I would just suggest that if you go to cpapracticeadvisor.com and search portal, you'll see our reviews of portal software, and that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Um, especially because they're really geared towards the accounting profession. And Gail, right? We're, 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 for December 1st today, we have plenty of time to change what you've historically been doing about how you transmit po uh, private and confidential information to your clients. We could do it through the portal. You all have time to do that. Oh, yeah, implementing a portal can be done in almost Piece real of time. Cake. Yeah, that, that one's an easy one. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, a uh, question about using public computers. Um, mm. We did talk about going over to the coffee shop if your own system is down. So. Just don't. I mean, <laughs> yeah, just, just, it's just, okay to go to the coffee shop, but just be careful of what you're doing at the coffee shop. Yeah, so, you know, we, we talked earlier mm -hmm. about, you know, making certain that, you know, you're, you're, you have an encrypted session. So if you're, if you're doing, uh, you know, you're connecting to a, a cloud-based, you know, service uh, and it's an encrypted session, even though you're sitting at the coffee shop, you're, you're going to be in good shape. Uh, but if you're making a connection back to the office and you haven't made a VPN connection first and you're starting to move files back and forth, 
that's a problem. Uh, but public computers in general, just step away. Uh, Stay you away. have no idea what's on that machine, where that machine has been, who's made modifications to it, if there's a key logger on it. You just, you, you don't know, and that is a high risk transaction. God, don't at, at, don't at access your cloud-based oh, tax software <laughs> from a public machine. Oof. Yeah, just be extremely careful and due diligent. Do your due diligence with respect to that. Don't connect into, you see a Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi, don't connect just because it's free, because it has access. I pull a spoof all the time. I set up free, free Wi-Fi spots and capture information all the time. I do it to CPAs in conferences where I'm speaking to show how vulnerable we all are. Whether or not it's asking for a password or no password, it doesn't matter. Be extremely careful. Every year at the, the Black Hat Conference in Las Vegas, one of the exercises they go through is taking just USB keys and just dropping them randomly, you know, on the sidewalk around town kind of thing, and then monitor how long it takes for someone to plug it into the machine and, you know, essentially it phones home. And it's, it's sometimes it's a matter of minutes. Oh, it's yeah. unbelievable. The people just can't resist. We're vulnerable. The temptation Everyone is, is so, but that's where we get back to the human element. And really, so much of security gets back to the end user and, you know, them participating in a powerful way to understand, again, I need to think before I click, think before I, I do something that really, Puts, puts me at risk and my data at risk.